thank you for your kindness and generosity. Uh, Manoj exaggerates my virtues and has mentioned none of my vices, even though he knows many of them. And since we commit most of them together, uh, perhaps that is why he shied away from uh, mentioning them. But I thank you kindly um, for making me look good in front of my wife, Amma, who is here with us tonight. <laughs> Um, yesterday, we went uh, on a walking tour of old Hyderabad. Um, we had an extraordinary gentleman, a scholar himself. Uh, it was the first time a PhD has given me a tourist tour of anywhere. So I was beginning to feel uh, rather important, and even more so that I stand in front of all of you here uh, this evening. Uh, I hope some of what I say at least will make some sense, but I offer no guarantees. Uh, you took a chance, and so uh, here goes. Um, some of you have asked us in just the casual conversations we've had this evening uh, how we are enjoying our visit. We've only been here just over two days. And I have replied, and I will say to the rest of you, that the most striking thing about this visit, more than my visit to Northern India 22 years ago as a correspondent, um, was the extraordinary familiarity, the striking familiarity between the country of my birth, Nigeria, and uh, India. And uh, the almost uncanny uh, identical twin similarities between Hyderabad and Lagos. Um, from the just jumble of electric wires to the tuk-tuks that are also similarly painted yellow, to the great cacophony of voices in the streets and the teeming multitudes, to uh, the street food, to the motorcyclists, to uh, dear devils, in their own ways, which makes it a frightening experience to attempt to drive in this town or in my hometown of Lagos. Um, they, it's just too striking. Also, people try to feed you to death. I think we share this in common. So I've gained a few pounds in the last uh, uh, few days. I don't even want to mention other similarities between our two countries in the sense that Nigeria is almost like a miniature India. I mean, we have crooks in parliament, gangsters as governors, uh, the whole thing. <laughs> so I feel right at home. Thank you for having me, and thank you for having my wife here as well. Um, I come originally from a small town in southwestern Nigeria, a small university town uh, called Ife. Our part of town, which we uh, often described as an independent republic. It's called Mudakeke. Of course, we were in rivalry with the rest of the town. You are familiar with these things. Everybody's uh, in competition with uh, everybody else. And in this hometown, I happen to have been born at the right time, by which I mean Nigeria had just gained independence after a decade of home rule. Uh, from the same colonial authorities as India, that's another similarity. And it was a great, it was a time of great optimism, surging optimism, in fact. Uh, there were writers and artists and musicians and scientists and linguists uh, and politicians with great oratorical powers, newspaper men. And I just wanted to be like all of these people. But most of all, I wanted to be like the writers at my own university, uh, uh, especially those who congregated around Wale Shoyinka, the Nobel Prize winner in literature, who uh, was the chairman of the, uh, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of, the, of the literature department at the university. Uh, because they were just, they looked like dashing men and women to me. And when I was a kid, on Sunday afternoons, we would go uh, to the local theater. There was only one in my hometown called Orio Locum Theater, where they uh, tried out their new plays before it went on the road. So this was the environment in which I was growing up in this small corner of Western Nigeria. 
And I was so determined to be a writer and a journalist that I never applied to university to study anything else, despite the protestations of my father, who thought only vagrants studied journalism, and that if you didn't study law, engineering, or medicine, then you were nobody at all. I think this is probably familiar to some of you in the audience. Uh, people are people everywhere. Um, but I uh, managed to get accepted to the University of Lagos to study journalism under a famous Nigerian professor who himself had studied under Marshall McLuhan in Canada. And I was determined for him to be my professor, Alfred E. Opubo. And so that was what began my life in journalism, which then took me uh, out of my home country, first to the United States, and from which they uh, asked me to travel the world while paying me to do so, the fools. Uh, so it has been a grand privilege for me to have been able to engage the world uh, and to learn so much uh, from what people are, which I think by far the greatest study that we have to constantly embark upon is the study of understanding human beings which then unlocks the doors to everything else, how we design better societies, how we relate to one another, how we care for our children and restore our planet. It all starts with understanding human nature. And lately, it appears as if we've been failing uh, more than usual uh, in this understanding. Hence, the myriad of uh, challenges that now confront us uh, all over the world. So we, just 25 years ago, uh, we were embarking on a period of great optimism um, because the Berlin Wall fell uh, in, I think that was in 1989, and the collapse of uh, the repressive uh, system of communism uh, in the Soviet republics of the era. And following rapidly after that was we saw one fine day, my wife and I, we had no children then, such a glorious time, uh, in New York City, <laughs> and uh, on TV with the rest of the world, here comes this old man who was like a ghost. Nelson Mandela walked out of prison. February, uh, it was, in fact, the 30th anniversary was only two or three days ago. Uh, when he walked out of prison, and I could not believe this spectacle before me because growing up in Nigeria, in my teens in high school and my university years, we had only one singular political purpose, and that was to defeat the last bastion of white rule on the African continent. And so to begin to see that come apart with the extraordinary sights that we saw on TV that day, uh, represented a time when we thought finally human beings had arrived. This was on the heels of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And then, of course, rapidly after that, the troubles in Ireland came to an end. Now we began to think that maybe we had uh, uh, broken the code. The Morse code of human challenges uh, appeared to have been uh, uh, broken. And uh, in subsequent years, Turkey was held up as an example of what a modern Muslim state could be. An open Muslim and secular state that allowed freedom for others to flourish. And so that allows us to also conclude that Islam is not inherently uh, authoritarian, closed in, and violent. Because after all, here is this example of Turkey. And of Indonesia, of course, had always been similarly mild-mannered. So we were able to see all these things that made us hopeful. And as I always say to my friends, hope is the only reason we get up in the morning. And were it not for hope, my wife would still not be here after 31 years, uh, despite the evidence. Hope makes us get up in the morning, and a lot of these things that were happening in our world led us to believe that we were finally cracking the code. China also was increasingly open. The era of one-man rule ended with Mao 
and it took them a few years to sort themselves out, but Deng Xiaoping set them on a path to greater openness, economic prosperity, the improvement of human life. All of these were great achievements. Lula in Brazil began to bridge the gap, the most savage inequality known to man, which was present in Brazil. Their Gini coefficient was the most distorted on earth. And he created this slew of programs. So we were marching on the armies of the just. As we say in Aspen, Manoj, the intergalactic army of the just was on the march. So what happened to us? In recent years, we have begun to experience the return of racial antagonisms. Even in the home of Nelson Mandela in South Africa, which had given such an example uh, to the world, we have seen the return of rightist militarism in Brazil. Uh, we have seen appalling and murderous political leadership in the Philippines where the president boasts openly that he had killed more than 3,000 people, extrajudicial killings, because he said they are drug addicts and drug traders, so we just shoot them. So no consequence, and he remains acceptable uh, on global stages and is free to travel, and this is the world we now live in. In China, which was increasingly open, including when we lived there, when I was posted there in the late 90s, where they had term limits that were being strictly observed, uh, after Deng Xiaoping, it was uh, 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 um, the following president, the name ex escapes me now, he had a maximum of 10 years, two five-year terms, and following him was Hu Jintao, who also similarly was term limited, and now we have uh, uh, Xi Jinping who has removed the term limits and is increasingly looking like the strong man of the Mao era down to the tunic. Uh, so we experience all these reverses. Russia got a sniff of democracy and quickly crawled back into its shell. Uh, the less said about my adopted country, the United States, the better. Uh, I don't need to uh, bore you to death with the details of our current depredations. Um, Britain has attempted to shoot itself in both feet. <laughs> need I even mention your own country? I do not yet know enough about India uh, to make pronouncements, even though that has never stopped me in the past. And so I'm here to learn more uh, about this moment that India seems to be experiencing. Because I have to say that you have been an example to us for so long of your founding leadership, of your leadership of the non-aligned movement, of the great profusion of philosophers and literary minds. Uh, even the mean-spirited V.S. Naipaul, one of the great geniuses of the letters, uh, could claim some ancestry from this place. Um, Vikram Seth, you know, a suitable boy. Uh, I have read so much and love this place so much. I read about Gandhi, studied Gandhi. Uh, we use him in one of our seminars. We show the movie, we read the books. You've been an example to us for so long that one can but be stunned that if we say we want to come and learn something from India, now you have to pause first. And so I want to understand why that is. So I hope tonight that you are not the only ones asking me questions, but I may ask you a few myself. So we might pause there to consider why the open society appears to be slamming shut in our faces. Why is that? How did we get to this point? Um, I want to propose two or three reasons, by definition incomplete, but can trigger some thinking on our parts. One thing you are not going to get from me, not the least because of my many inadequacies, is that you are not going to get any answers. But at least, hopefully, you might get some pinpricks that allow you to think further about what your own understanding is of the world we live in, broadly speaking, 
and of the Indian movement uh, more particularly. My first proposition is that we have had a democratization of information. Beware what you seek, because you might get it. When I was young, the soundtrack of my life in Nigeria at the time was the every three or four years or so, the ominous voice of the colonel announcing on national radio and TV, both of which were exclusively owned by the government, that in the interest of national unity, stability, and the ending of corruption, they had seized power yet again. Why was this easy for them to do? Um, that was because they had absolute control over information. In those days, if you were a drunken colonel and you had a couple of your buddies, and before you left the officer's mess that night, you would have planned out to seize the government. All you had to do was go to national radio and national TV, all both typically in the same compound, you know, hold up guns to the heads of the announcers and producers, seize control of the microphones, and broadcast to the country that you had now taken power. That's all it took. This has become impossible now. When was the last time you heard of a coup in a, anywhere in Africa or in uh, Latin America? Because nobody controlled information anymore. So we will say to ourselves, how wonderful. Because now I can call my aging mother in Modakeke, my hometown in Nigeria, and ask how she's doing. And occasionally we'll even do it on FaceTime. So she can at least see the appearance of me on the screen. Uh, not the real thing. Uh, you could call your driver to meet you because you're just stepping out of your office or any number of things. It made life a lot easier for us, so that's a good thing. What we didn't realize was that one of the consequences of this democratization of information was the removal of the gatekeepers. Gatekeepers such as myself, newspaper editors, TV producers, the college professor, the imam, and the priests, and the, uh, and the doctor, and any number of people who were supposed to have more specialized knowledge about particular aspects of our lives, who mediate our relationship with these issues, the democratization of information was sweeping them all away. So no more middlemen. We thought this was a good thing, but what that has done is that it has weaponized information. So that we are now at the inflection point where falsehood and fact can no longer be easily differentiated. And this has now slipped into our bloodstream and is poisoning us, is poisoning our civic spaces, and we as yet do not know what to do about it. So the removal of gatekeepers, the weaponization of information, uh, the 400 pound kid in Kiev in hysteric cloth robes who is manipulating information to put protesters on the, risk, on the streets of resting Virginia, who think that they're exercising free will and are acting to protest something that they didn't know had been implanted in their heads from some guy in his bedroom in Kiev. This is the world that we now live in where the idea of human agency, of free will, is actually now in question. This is a consequence, uh, unintended no doubt, of this. I know of people who have been killed here in India because of utterly unfounded rumors about whether some girls had been raped or abducted in a village and the poor sorts who were passing through were set upon and beaten to death and their bodies set on fire based on a complete false story that was spread on WhatsApp. This is what the weaponization of information looks like in our world today. Also, this free flow of information, whether true or false, whether junk or real, uh, as heightened emotions in civic spaces. The constant drip feeding of all of this constantly making you angry all the time. We have completely forgotten 
at the admonition from Saul Bello that indignation is so wearing that it is best uh, saved for the main offense. That we should not die on every hill, but in today's world, we are constantly angry about something. And we have no moment for reflection because we have the infinite capacity to fire off our responses right away. A life without reflection, as you well know, in this one of the world's great cultures, is hardly worth living at all. But that is the environment in which we now live. This heightened state, this heightened hyper-awareness of everything relevant or not uh, is uh, 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 giving rise to a surge in uh, impassioned nationalisms and religious fundamentalisms and the sorting of people into ever smaller tribes uh, and now the twain shall meet. In my youth, in Modakeke, you will hear a lot about Modakeke from me tonight. Uh, although I must warn you that it has become a bit idealized in my mind with removal from home for so long. Uh, so all of this may not be true in every particular, but in my idealized remembrance of my hometown, I knew that Christians and Muslims and worshippers of various Yoruba gods Shango, Ogun, Ifa, Divination System, Obatala, Yemaja, all of them, all this great cacophony of people, very similar to India also, uh, celebrated all their festivals together. So you go from one household to the other, and it was only in the last 30 or so years uh, that we had begun to see more hardened uh, lines drawn between these people. Uh, and people began to get literal in their translation of their religious texts in a way that excludes others. So this also is added to the democratization of information, the turbocharged, unfettered capitalism that has created winner-take-all societies over the last three decades or so, as we have bought into the liberal or neoliberal argument that the less government, the better. The fewer regulations, the better. Uh, that, in fact, individual freedom triumphs above all. The consequence of this is that capitalism, which arguably is the most effective way of creating value, left to its own devices, is the worst way of distributing wealth. And so, as had become it has become less and less fettered. We have now seen, and I will not bore you with the numbers because I, I would hazard the guess that most people in this, under these lovely trees tonight, know those numbers very well because they are shocking. So I will not bother to repeat them. But we have seen over 30 years or so the upward redistribution of wealth in every single society. Even though India's uh, reforms of the past few decades has without doubt created a lot more wealth and lifted loads of people, hundreds of millions of people out of abject poverty, all of which are no mean feats, uh, the gap between the haves and the have-nots have ne nevertheless raised ahead. And because we now have these devices in our hands, even though you have improved my life and I can now afford the tuk-tuk to take me to the marketplace, unlike before when I had to walk, I know that you now live in a 33-story mansion uh, and that the gap between you and me has never been wider, despite the improvement in my own life. The knowledge of this makes me resentful because I think I have been had. And also, of course, to add to this sense of dislocation is that the uh, rapid globalization of our world, which, as we have seen, has so many strengths, not the least of which is my mode of dressing tonight, uh, which is made by an Indian tailor in Durban, and I've been using him 
for the last uh, 14 years or so, this is my mode of dressing anywhere in the world that I am. And it is not because I was coming to Hyderabad. But this is made for me by an Indian tailor in, in Dubai. And this is what globalization means. We are now smashed against one another at a rate so rapid that it is actually causing dislocation of settled societies. We have towns that change overnight, like almost literally overnight. We have people who don't look or talk like us suddenly in our neighborhoods and in our schools and in our marketplaces. And we're unnerved by these changes because it turns out that we are not wired to absorb changes at that rapid a pace. So this feeling of dislocation, wired with all the other things I'd mentioned before, is creating this moment for us all over the world where presidents are free to boast that they could shoot people in the streets for no consequence. And in fact, it is not just a boast because we know that in the Philippines it has happened and to no consequence. So, how do we get out of this? To quote uh, Lenin, what is to be done? Um, I don't have answers for you, as I suggested earlier, but I do have some thoughts. Some of them better baked than others. And during the question and answer sessions, perhaps we can help refine some of these things together. So just before I go into the specific uh, suggestions that I have in mind, uh, after all my travels and all my interactions and all my work and all my efforts to try and understand human beings better, uh, this is what I've begun to think. That at core, and as I said at the beginning of my presentation, we need a deeper understanding of human beings, and especially because it will point us unavoidably to our essential sameness. Our essential sameness. Because we forget all too easily uh, that the understanding of human beings is at the heart of how we might begin to solve our problems. And by not understanding human beings, we also, do, we also forget that things don't stay fixed and that we regress and that we go around in circles and that we forget and need to be reminded all the time. So 15 years ago, when I was going through my 15 seconds of fame as a winner of the Pulitzer Prize, I was now at the global pinnacle of my chosen career. So I became a little bit of a, a minor star. So the World Bank would invite me to talk to their board. Uh, TV stations want to interview me. And somehow, the narrative developed that I was the first African to win the Pulitzer Prize. This is pure fiction, as I found later. And I should have known, because there was a white South African photographer who took the famous picture that probably all of you remember during the famine in Somalia, of the vulture approaching this boy who was almost dying. It was one of the most heartbreaking pictures. He won the Pulitzer Prize for photography. I knew him. And the reason I knew him, we were based in South Africa together at that time. I was the New York News the Bureau Chief in Johannesburg, and we were covering Somalia together. But when the narrative of the first African winner of the Pulitzer Prize developed, this you know, played to my ego and had a ring of truth, but it was not the old truth. So in this short stardom, when I was invited to everything, I interviewed by all sorts of people, and when they would say, well, how does it feel to be the first African winner of the Pulitzer Prize? I said, it fills me with immense pride, not least of all because my daughters are like looking at me as if by magic, and my wife, it buys me another six months of goodwill, before it expires, this is a wonderful prize to win for this and other reasons. And then it was always followed by the question, and how does it make you feel that Rwanda, uh, they had this genocide there. How does it make you feel as an African? And for the first couple of times, I was stumped by this question 
Because there is a bit of a sense of shame that the place where you come from is where this infernal, horrendous human uh, catastrophe had occurred. So you are a little defensive. But by the third, and I'm a fairly quick learner, by the third interview, I had my answer ready. So when the inevitable uh, question comes, typically from a, a white American interviewer, how does it make you feel as an African that these Rwandans were killing themselves? So I said, it was with great disappointment. Because I thought African people were special people who would never behave like the Germans or the Indonesians, or the Turks and the Armenians, or any number of people where people have been massacred, wiped out throughout all regions of the earth. I said, that's my only disappointment. It turns out African people were not special after all. We're just human. I tell this story because the first thing we have to remember is how incredibly identical we are. By identical, I don't even mean by skin color, even though you get that in every country, in every region of Earth. I don't even mean uh, by faith. I mean as humans, that essence that makes us human. It is so identical, you will be stunned at being reminded of it. So one of the arguments of today's age with our millennial children and their cohorts and a few of uh, the people who are older than them, uh, is all of this re-examination of history and all these evil colonialists and so on. And I said, yeah, okay, so it's evil to colonize another uh, people. However, we are all guilty of it. It is not some white people who created colonialism. That has always been the process of empire formation throughout history represented even here in this very city of Hyderabad. We're all colonialists at one point or the other. The Zulu nation you might have heard of in South Africa, the Zulus were just a little ethnic group 200 years ago until Shaka the Zulu, their famous warrior leader, had a, an innovation. It was a specific innovation that allowed him to invade neighboring tribes and groups capture them, turn them into Zulus, and all of a sudden you have the Zulu nation. I don't know what else is colonialism, if not that. So what was the innovation? Up until then, warfare was your army stands on this hill and the other army stands on the other hill, and you lob spears at one another. The moment the spear leaves your hand, it's gone. So you needed constantly to have more supplies of spear. So he created the short stabbing spear. It required enormous courage to fight in that way, but to create that courage, he brutally killed a lot of his own people to toughen them up. And then they go and they stab. They no longer lose their weapons, and the opposing armies were so fearful of them that they fled. And over a very short period of time, the Zulus had colonized all the surrounding tribes and created the Zulu nation who are now protesting colonialism by white people, uh, and the Brits were colonized by the, uh, the Germans, the Norman conquest. Colonialism is a fact of state formation and empire founding. There is absolutely no difference in the behavior of human beings when it comes to that. And I could give a billion examples of what uh, this is like. So I would suggest that human nature is our starting point number one. The study of it, the understanding of it, and the more we know that we are absolutely the same and we be behave in absolutely predictable and similar ways, the less we are able to think of the other and how to exclude them and how to defeat them and how to crush them and how to malign them when we realize that there is no other. There is only us. So we start with that. And I, as a corollary to that, I've always, because I think that uh, being a good person, as well as being a bad person, is a matter of daily practice. So one of the things that I try to remind myself daily, in addition to saying good morning to a stranger, or saying thank you to the person who brings me coffee, because these tiny little steps makes you think 
about the other human being and makes signals to them that you see them. This is practice that you build into yourself. So in that sense, I always tell myself, do not judge too harshly, even though we're all prone to it. We're all prone to snap judgments. We're all prone to making somebody feel like they are the absolute worst in the world and they've committed offenses that have never been committed before. This is not advocating uh, cheap uh, forgiveness or to let rapists and, and, and pillagers and, 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 and thieving leaders get away with it. No, no, not at all. It is just to recognize that a little bit of human kindness and not judging too harshly might make our environments a bit more tolerable than for all of us, rather than the constant shrieking that have now been amplified uh, on social media. Uh, the second one is that we have to make a conscious effort to return to the commons. Despite all the great strides that India has made, I will hazard the guess, because you are as human as other human beings I have encountered in all my travels, that in recent decades, you've abandoned the commons like the rest of us. Otherwise, we would not be going through these stresses. By the commons, I mean the things that we shared together, whether it's in the neighborhood, whether it's the public school system, whether it's uh, uh, our festivals and the things that we all shared, whether things that we didn't do in our own culture, but which we helped others celebrate in theirs. The commons, the idea of going to the cricket uh, game together and buying your three rupees ticket and standing together or sitting together before the arrival of the sky boxes and the gated communities and the private jets, all the things that have alienated us one from another and created the abandonment of the commons. We have to find our ways back to where we gather. And one of the best ways of doing this obviously is through public education. High quality public education for every child in every realm is not a magic bullet, but it is the best, as, uh, the best weapon we have in our asana to, uh, to fight this disengagement from one another, to have a common experience to read Chino Achebe together, and V.S. Naipaul together, and Vikram Set together, and Wale Shoinka together, and uh, James Baldwin together. To read the poetry together. Uh, this common language of the expression of the human being is one way for us to start rediscovering ourselves again. Because what we've had is, and we, my wife and I, as guilty as many of the parents here, or the grandparents here. Because we were lucky to go to the best schools that the world offers, we contrived and connived and donated money and prepared and everything to make sure our children also went there. Meanwhile, we've abandoned most of the other schools that children who knew no one go to, and so we are hardening this disengagement from the commons. We have to find our way back to it. There is also something that occurs to me, which is the proposition I am less sure-footed on as I stand before you, but which I think is probably the most important, and which is that we need to consider whether we remember too much. So Milan Kundera, in his famous book, The Book of Laughter and Forgetting, uh, had this famous quote that the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. And it is entirely understandable that we put up our gods and we uh, celebrate important days of our independence. India is free forever, says Jawaharlal Nehru. We will remember all of these days and we create all these rituals around them. We are in fact suspicious of forgetting things because we think it leads to amnesia and it can allow great crimes and monstrous actions to return. I want to propose that we consider a careful balancing between remembering and forgetting. Because 
if we go from the smallest unit or layer of our existence, such as in a marriage, and then I go back to my wife, we've been together for 31 years, without deliberately forgetting some things, there is no way our marriage survives. I have committed too many crimes uh, that if some of these are not forgotten and forgiven, we just will not be together. So just at the level of human relationships, we have to edit what we remember rather severely. This is also necessary in the larger society. If you remember the Bosnia War in uh, Central Europe in the 90s, what was the viciousness demonstrated against the Muslims about? The mass rape, the plunder. Because they said, well, when the Ottomans invaded in 1647 or something, they burnt the local church. And so now you are visiting almost literally the words of the Old Testament on these poor innocents. Visiting the sins of the father on the sons from generation to generation to generation. It is time for us to question our strong desire for always remembering everything. It is not everything that deserves uh, to be remembered if we, uh, to quote from Aeschylus, tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world. The South Africans have a word for it. That word is called Ubuntu. And the idea is that people are people through other people. In other words, I cannot be human unless you are too. I see you. Because of you, I am. People are people through other people. This, by the way, I do not think is some great original copyrighted thought on the part of the South Africans. Because I believe something like that also exists in your own culture. And in virtually every culture uh, that, with which we are familiar. People are people through other people is a cry for humanity, for humaneness, for gentleness, for love, for kindness. This is what we are called upon to do. Can we see one another once more? I mean to really see in order to perceive the full human being uh, before us. To cultivate kindness, to enact just laws, to restrain savage capitalism. The condition of freedom, as Hamatia Sen reminds us, is such that extreme poverty and freedom do not mix very well together. The world that is waiting for us to be created anew is the world that at its core has to be founded on love and generosity and forgiveness and dare I say also on careful forgetfulness. So yesterday, as I said at the start of my talk, uh, my wife and I had the privilege of being given a rather grand walking tour of old Hyderabad. It was an amazing experience for me. Uh, we took many pictures, we jostled with many people. We were right at home because we are Lagosians, we are used to this. Lagos has about twice the population of Hyderabad, but its heart is the same as the heart of Hyderabad. The jostling, the pushing, the talking, the, the smoke belching from the tuk-tuks, the wires, as I've described before. But of course, we were taken to all the grand palaces and, and the exquisite mosques and monuments and the archways to the city. And these were the things that we choose to remember. We choose not to remember the rape and the pillage, uh, the, the dirty works of empire creation. But that's fine, because I'm saying probably there are some things that are worth letting go of. So, these things also invoked, paradoxically in me, a sense of a little sadness. It was fleeting, but I filed it away. So, this is what it all is at the end. After all our strivings and the construction of the elaborate palaces on the backs of serfs and slaves, the magnificent carvings, the, <coughs> the ornaments, the soaring minarets and the shrines and uh, all of these beautiful things that are now crumbling around us, evoking Ozymandias, right? Is this the end of our striving? 
Is it in the monuments and the grand buildings? Or is it in people? What do we leave behind? To see one another, despite all our gods, all our colors, the cacophony of all our tongues, all that remains is the capacity to love them. And that's all that remains. Thank you. This is not a question, but uh, you just ask us, like, is there anything like Ubuntu in Indian culture? There is one thing which you might have seen a lot, like people doing Namaste to you. Correct. So the Namaste actually, the true meaning of Namaste in Sanskrit is the oneness, beauty, purity, and light in me is also within you. And in that, we are one. I and don't think they're all the same, right? They're all the same. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to make it. Thank you. Namaste. Question is around: Do you see any systems in the world today which are close to being ideal? If you look at some of the Nordic countries, they seem to have managed to strike a good balance because they have high taxation, yes. but they have free education, they have free healthcare. They seem to be happy nations in the world today. Of course, their populations are pretty low; uh, their incomes are high. But uh, do you see any such ideal systems which other nations can draw inspiration from and try to replicate? We have, we have something like that in Delhi happening recently, if you see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are never going to get the ideal, though it is nevertheless worth pursuing. As you've mentioned, perhaps the closest that we have come to that ideal today is the Nordic countries because they made a deliberate decision about 70, 75 years ago, immediately after the war, that they were going to create uh, common experiences for society over the generations. So they started that with their system of taxation as well as with their public education system. Everybody in those Nordic countries went through the same educational experience so that when you find yourself in positions of civic leadership, uh, you are speaking from the same playbook because uh, regardless of your background, you have received the same quality of education. It is not easy to replicate, but to not even make a honest effort uh, is a crime. Uh, you might also look at a small country in Africa called Botswana which is a, a neighboring country to South Africa and the world's largest producer of diamonds, um, they made a deliberate effort that this common resource, unlike most resource-driven states, was not going to be going to individuals but into a sovereign wealth fund that then funds education and public health and public infrastructure. They are a very small country of about three million people, but it is one of the gentlest and least abrasive societies you will ever encounter. They are still relatively poor, but there are no wild distributions of uh, wealth and income in that society. And uh, if you haven't, I urge you to read a series of really wonderful uh, novels uh, called The Number One Ladies Detective Agency. That is the start of the series, and it will give you a full sense of what Botswana and society is like. It's those things that I think we can emulate, and we can emulate things that work, that may work for us, that we find in other countries. So we may find, even in Russia, it's not a completely lost case, we may find some things that are worthy of emulating there. Despite this movement that my adopted country is going through, it is extraordinary that it is founding document, its constitution, its main goal, was for a more perfect union, which means we may never get there, but we will never stop trying to find a more perfect union. So wherever we can find inspiration to lead us onto this journey is where we need to look. I don't think we can find the ideal. It's just worth striving for it. Yeah, uh, sir, uh, when uh, Africa being uh, one of the most economically deprived continents and uh, places on Earth, do you think the entire debate of climate change is very relevant to the context of Africa in the sense that for one, to be able to produce jobs, manufacturing and grow and wealth, 
they obviously have to exploit the environment in the sense that cheapest power source is such a etc. of that sort. So this would ultimately lead to Africa emitting more and more for it to grow richer and rightly so. So do you think the entire debate of carbon caps or, or uh, climate change in general is very relevant to Africa and something that Africa should say take seriously or should it rather focus on getting its citizens rich first and then look at other priorities? Well, I don't think that we can even discuss climate change in terms of whether there are some people who are hiding in a cave somewhere that it wouldn't affect. It's already affecting all of us. This is self-evident. And despite social media and the equalization of truth and falsehood, it is in front of us. We are all suffering the consequences and no one can hide from it. So as in Africa as elsewhere, we all have to uh, pull our efforts in uh, trying to uh, retrieve, retrace our steps from this uh, ruinous way in which we are going. So as, as to whether people should be exploiting their, 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 their natural resources, um, yes and no. It depends on what natural resource it is and what the cost to the society and to the environment the exploitation is. So if you are arguing that, say, the Chinese should do clear cutting of timber of the Congolese rainforest, I will say no that we have to find other means of creating wealth and livelihood in the Congo than clear cutting one of the world's two largest rainforests and effectively the lungs of the, of the earth. Uh, so that will be ruinous. But whether they do an hydro dam to create power, cheap power in Ethiopia, uh, for which they are in a, in a kind of a spot with Egypt right now, uh, that's more debatable. But uh, so all these things have to be approached on a case-by-case -case basis because there are always pros and cons to them. Sir, I'm Ram Mohan. Among all the population across the globe, there is a commonality, very minimum commonality across all the people. That's what we refer to as Paramahma in Indian context. <laughs> and there is an equal or more amount of the difference in the I mean, other part. And within the difference, there is a difficult part. Mm -hmm. Now, to achieve this global harmony, so how to understand this commonality, we perceive it to some extent, mm -hmm. but how to really understand the commonality, it is very comfortable to say it, mm -hmm. and how to deal with the different aspects among the humans, and within the different, the difficult aspects, so how do we approach, need to approach, mm -hmm. to achieve it, Yes. Thank you. Um, I don't have a straight answer for you. I can only say that the reasons that we accentuate the differences amongst us, which are mostly superficial differences, uh, is because of greed. Because we want to gain unfair advantage, or we want to gain power, or we want to otherwise lord over somebody else. This is why we look to define ourselves as different from somebody else. I mean, I'm different from my wife. Does that mean that we cannot cohabit and coexist peacefully together? So uh, it is a matter of motivation. If we create ways for telling the proper stories, and luckily for us, we are creatures of storytelling. This is how we communicate. If we can create the stories that allow us to see clearly who we are, which is that we are all the same in all the fundamentals. Uh, I may put on a coat and you may put on a shirt and pants, but that is so uh, ephemeral. What remains is the human being, and I don't think that that is uh, 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 a matter for serious dispute. We just have to tell the stories better and educate ourselves better in the ways in which we are common. I like to use the example of colonialism because it gets people's blood up. These evil white people colonizing us. There is not a single square inch of earth that has not been colonized by someone. Right? So if we're able to expand our horizons that way, then you can at least calmly and rationally and with a generous spirit discuss the solutions that we can apply to our current problems. So that's the only way that I know how, and which is one of the pleasures uh, for me of appearing before an audience like this. Uh, how free is the press in Nigeria relative to what it was some 20 years ago and now? 
and how free is it related to what is the world and what is it. Okay. This is an interesting question about Nigeria because I said, and I didn't mean it as a joke, that Nigeria and India are just uncannily uh, similar in so many respects. That even under military rule, it is hard for Nigerians not to be free and to fully express their freedom in their rambunctious and irrepressible ways. Uh, there has never been a time really, save a brief period under a particularly bloodthirsty military ruler called Sani Abacha in the late 90s for about a three year period or so. There has never been a period in which Nigerians were not really free to express themselves and to fight and argue and yell very much like the Indians do. Uh, and so Nigeria is as free as ever now. But that has not translated into the improvement of the commons. Uh, if anything, uh, we have seen a deterioration in the widening inequality, in the uh, degraded public education system, in the insecurities in communities, particularly in the far north of the country, uh, with Boko Haram and various insurgent groups, like some of the troubles you are having in pockets of your own country, uh, and especially from some of your uh, uh, neighbors. And so it is not because of freedom. It's because we have uh, gangsters in parliament and thieves in state houses and a population that is so stressed that it is unable to fight them effectively yet. I recommend in your short stay here. You should see the 9 o'clock news in India on TV. <laughs> and you understand what freedom is all about. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, like I uh, told you just before you began your talk, I was struck by the similarity in uh, both our countries, between both our countries, Nigeria and India, after reading Chimamanda America. Yes. Both are good actually, Papua Yellow Sun and later uh, America. Yes. I was just a little bit curious about the current political scene. I mean, how does it uh, compare with the rise of right wing activism everywhere in the world? So what you are seeing in Nigeria, thank you for that. What you are seeing in Nigeria is more uh, a, a sharper definition of religious difference than we've ever had before between North and South. The North is predominantly Muslim, the South is predominantly Christian, and there are in between people like me who can't be pinned down to one or the other. Uh, uh, this is the sharpest the differences have been defined in my, in my lifetime. People have become increasingly intolerant of one another uh, these are consequences of a broken uh, place uh, where Nigeria now has more poor people than India. I mean, in absolute numbers, not in percentage. So you can see how stressed the country is. And in that atmosphere of stress and impoverishment and people feeling insecure and unsettled, they turn on one another. We've seen this in every country. Yeah. Okay. How do you define democracy in today's world? And how does the democracy help to bring a good society in the divided world? I have been struggling with the question of democracy, if I would dare to be honest with you, which I hope I have been tonight. And my struggle has been this that I am no longer persuaded that democracy, as we define it now, um, is necessarily a solution for every society, no matter the stage of their development. I am no longer absolutely persuaded that democracy is what everybody at all times and in all epochs need. This is to be differentiated from the idea of freedom, the idea of human freedom. For me, that is so core to us being human that that is not open to compromise for me. But if a system can guarantee my core freedoms while more efficiently delivering public goods, I might be tempted to consider it and give up my voting every four years, maybe in exchange for doing something else. Right? And what are these core freedoms? The freedom for us to gather together tonight in communion with one another, to speak freely, to criticize your parliament and mine, 
to drink tea together without fear that somebody is going to start shooting us from the surrounding walls. That freedom is core to me, the freedom of speech and of civic gathering. Second, I am a very firm believer in the freedom and the right to property. That your property should not be casually taken away from you unless for just cause. Just cause being defined very strictly as something being in the common interest so that eminent domain might kick in. Because without having the right to your own household, where you protect your family and raise your children, if that is subject to the whims of the chief minister of this state, then you do not have a core freedom. So that's another. Freedom of worship is also important to me. Um, you will forgive me that I am a faithless man, as, except in human beings. But my immediate younger sister not only has a PhD in theology, but is also the pastor of a church. She ministers to a congregation. And so, but she's my sister and I love her dearly and she loves me. And if she comes to our dining table to eat, she always insists on praying first. I have absolutely no problem with this. Where I might have a problem is if she now insists that I must join her in the prayer before we can eat. So I believe in live and let live. So long as your actions do not harm me in any way, I am absolutely tolerant of it. I will not smoke in an enclosed space, even though I enjoy the occasional cigar. But if I'm sitting under the banyan tree and light up a cigar, or Barty and Manoj in their overflowing kindness have allowed me to use their back porch to smoke a cigar, and if you are now in my face about that, then we are going to have a problem. So I believe in core freedoms as more necessary to a healthy, functioning human society. This is not necessarily your classic definition of democracy as having elections for parliament every couple of years or so, and so on and so forth. Now, that itself is highly valuable because as we can see, probably one of the things that has kept India together as a nation is that you have these outlets of full political expression that allows differences not to always result in violence or force. There is something of inherent quality in democracy in that sense. But this is not necessarily the best way to achieve common goods for every society regardless of their state of development. So for example, in South Africa, because of the experience of apartheid and white minority rule over several centuries, they prioritize human freedoms and democracy. They have the world's most liberal constitution because of their experience of racial oppression, they prioritize these democratic freedoms more than anything else. But the cost of that is gross inefficiency in the administration of the state. So that the equality they seek in real terms is delayed for many decades because they don't have efficient vehicles for delivering them. So for example, the teachers union, which is notorious and protects teachers who don't show up to teach your children, will not allow you to fire any teacher. This cannot be good for the country, but I can understand why they prioritize democratic freedoms over anything else. Contrast that to Rwanda, which has prioritized the securing of human life above all else because of the experience of the genocide. So Paul Kagame, their president, is an autocratic leader. There is no question about it. But Kigali, their capital, is probably the world's safest city. I can personally attest to this because I've been to, I don't know, 200 cities across the world. You can walk alone at 3 a.m. in Kigali from one end of the city together without even feeling insecure there. But to get to that, the prioritization of the securing of human beings, they are autocratic. And I don't have any evidence, but they've probably bumped off a couple of opposition figures. But this derives from their experience of the genocide, which happened only 25 years ago, right? So different countries prioritizing different things, which leads me to think 
that it is possible that one size does not fit all. And even if we define it broadly as democracy, within it, it should be adapted to local conditions because the improvement of human life, the cultivation of the human mind, uh, the public goods that we seek, the protection of human life, and whatever system gets us there faster while protecting some of the core freedoms I mentioned, our right inherent in us to have this gathering and speak to one another in communion, our right to the security of the roof over our family's heads, our right to our faith, even for somebody like me who does not believe. These are fundamental, and we should respect them. If we can craft other systems that respect this, I could be tempted to consider them. That's a long-winded answer, but uh, I thought it, it, it was worth uh, paying the, the time. Uh, good evening, sir. Yes. So I have a two-part question. So uh, firstly, with the rise of social media, and uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, everywhere on, on social media, you see uh, to, uh, it's basically a battlefield of uh, ideologies and opinions with, uh, uh, you know, facts usually being left behind or getting distorted mm -hmm. uh, in the process. And uh, you see a lot of uh, governments which have, uh, uh, which are rising which are coming up uh, in different countries uh, throughout the world, which, have, which show signs of uh, fascism, early signs of fascism, and uh, you know, which uh, show blatant disregard for uh, human rights, uh, as you said in Philippines and some say Brazil and uh, some say India too. And uh, 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 so how would you, uh, in this in, uh, age of social media, where uh, hate is the emotion, uh, according to Facebook, hate is the emotion which propagates faster than any other emotion. Uh, and this group of uh, Twitter too, which is basically a cesspool of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, battlefield and uh, of ideologies. Mm -hmm. So, um, as you are a renowned journalist and you have a rich experience, how do you think um, this uh, technology is going to uh, make a difference and how do you think we can battle uh, this particular, uh, yeah. uh, you know, to stop that? Sure, I, I, I get your uh, point. Um, Okay, so um, I have reluctantly come to the conclusion that we have to regulate social media. Um, the cost is just too high, the temperature is too high, the falsehood is too deep and pervasive that to entrust the regulation of our conversation in the commons worldwide to a youngster and his hand-picked board in Palo Alto for a, at a company called Facebook seems to me the height of foolishness. This thing is poisoning us and we need to find an intelligent way, not with a sledgehammer, but an intelligent way to regulate how these social platforms uh, are function. It used to be that uh, before the end of newspapers, India is one of the last holdouts in this, but even here the newspapers are struggling a little bit. Before the end of newspapers, we were held accountable. And traditional TV news stations were held accountable for the truth or falsehood of what they propagate. But these Silicon Valley denizens have managed to persuade us that they should be exempt from the consequences of the information that they help spread to nearly three billion people, whether it's through Facebook, through Twitter, Instagram, WhatsApp, and any number of this. By the way, I am not on Facebook, I am not on Instagram, I deleted my LinkedIn account, and only because of my journalism bias that I remain toehold on Twitter. Otherwise, you won't find me anywhere else. I find it's distracting. It makes you want to lash out at people. I find myself having to restrain myself from making a clever comment about something. They are too poisonous. They need to be regulated, but carefully and not with a sledgehammer. That's my view.
Into the mic. Quality acting as a disruptive woman, uh, nature. Quality is acting as a woman, as a disruptive mechanism of woman. Right. And another thing is that African nations searching their answers in European Union. That's okay. I understood the second question. I'm afraid that I didn't quite understand the first one. Foreign acting as a disruptive woman. Foreign aid. Foreign aid. Foreign aid. Hmm. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, so, the African Union, uh, to take the second part of your question, uh, is largely ineffectual, although it has begun to do some things to show signs of intelligent life, if we put it that way, uh, in the last few years, uh, because they are now in the early processes of creating an Africa free trade area, which will basically be the equivalent of a trader in, Guj in uh, Gujarat not being restricted to trade with somebody in Hyderabad, to open up the entire continent for trade and for movement of people and goods and ideas. So that, if implemented properly, will be an extraordinary thing. I don't think a common currency uh, and I'm not an expert on all things, and I should be careful how I make this comment, but from my very rudimentary understanding of economics and finance, I don't think that uh, the evidence is conclusive that a common currency, for example, is needed uh, on the continent. The ex uh, experience of Portugal and, and Greece and Southern Europe in general relative to the euro gives us pause. Uh, in that regard. But I do believe in the free movement of people and goods, and I do not believe any African should be obtaining a visa to go to any African country. I think let's just start with those and get used to those before we take even bigger steps in the future for continental integration, which I think will improve the quality of human life uh, from Cape to Cairo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as a journalist who got to the peak of his career, his profession. Uh, it's a question. Uh, yesterday I met one of India's leading, greatest journalists who a few months ago stepped down from journalism because mm -hmm. she says, she said yesterday, it's become too hard to be a journalist and mm -hmm. do uh, truthful journalism today. Mm -hmm. From your position, and I'm sure there are journalists in the audience, can you give them a message for how important their role is if you will stiffen their spine as well, mm -hmm. give all of us some hope for how important the role of the journalist is yes. in order to make the good society come about. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I think I should be uncharacteristically humble enough and say that I am actually not in any strong position to lecture them about what is best for them. I think they fully understand the, re the, the importance of journalism to the good society. Because members of our tribe, we are a self-selecting tribe. You do not become very rich by being a journalist. We choose to go into it because that is our spirit. So because they are already journalists, and she has been a journalist, the person to whom you refer, uh, they already understand it. They don't need me to tell them that. Now, the particular circumstances may require somebody to take, make a strategic uh, retreat. This is also a very good thing in war, right? So that you're not like that French general at the Battle of the Man who says, my flanks have melted away, my rear has collapsed, I no longer see my battalion. Situation is excellent, high charge, right? Of course they wipe them out completely. Uh, so there might be times that you make a strategic retreat and to f uh, uh, recuperate from the many wounds that we suffer in this job, both emotional and physical. There was a period of about five years that my wife and I uh, went back into the furnace in Nigeria to start uh, a big investigative newspaper project there. It was a duply scarring experience for us. And uh, I think I did the same thing that this lady that you mentioned did. I retreated for about five years because I needed to find myself again. When we were going through the experience, because our home at that time was in Johannesburg, and I was essentially spending all my time in Lagos, 
I discovered after we closed down the newspaper that over that five-year period, I had never spent a continuous two months under the same roof with my family. We had teenage children who were in high school in Johannesburg at the time. The cost of this thing could be exceedingly high and not just financial. So I cannot offer advice to this person. I can only say that I hear you, I feel you, I've gone through the same thing, and I have no doubt that she will make her way back in there. Believe me, uh, she self-selected to be a journalist to start with. And if it, had, if it is a senior journalist, as you described, this person has had many, many, many experiences and fully understands what role she and the fellow journalists of our tribe uh, need to play in creating the good society. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. So um, I really quite admire your faith in the um, your seeming faith that I have. Uh, an expertise in everything. Uh, I assure you that I do not. I do hope that I have common sense and so I may give some common sense answers in areas where I do not have a spe specific expertise. So on the question of globalization, it is the same thing. One size does not fit all. There will be aspects of globalization. Broadly speaking, it's a good thing. I mean, look how nice I look from the work of an Indian tailor. That's globalization at one level, right? But it is also globalization that crushes uh, dearly held rituals and customs and so on in society. So you have to decide for yourself, and I believe societies should re retain the power to decide for themselves where possible, where they're not overrun by the rampaging armies of Silicon Valley, uh, to decide for themselves the extent of their engagement with the rest of the world. Some of it are under your control, large numbers of these are not. So it's a careful balancing act as to what you take out of globalization. Uh, every benefit comes with a cost as we know with everything else in life. I am generally a fan of globalization, but uh, with uh, tempered with, with uh, uh, hesitancy in some degrees and with common sense in others. I don't think unfettered globalization makes sense. Today, I have a question. As many stated, imperialism is the highest form of capitalism. In the present context, as imperialism is raising among the countries with different hegemonic powers, what will be the future of the future bourgeois society, bourgeois people who are living in different countries? And is this neoliberalism, which emphasizes the rich, the progress, and poor to be do you will be divided in the different political and economical forms? Or is there any chance in the future where we will be united upon? Is there a chance of what? Being united upon. I don't understand it, I'm sorry. Is there any chance in this divided society of political and economical divisions? Is there any chance where we will be united upon? Uh -huh. Where can we be united? Oh, of course, of course, there is always a chance. I said that, you know, getting up in the morning is an act of hope over experience, right? If you have become completely hopeless, why do you need to get up? You should just order a bottle of whiskey and start drinking it the moment you open your eyes. But we do not do this because we have hope and we have some evidence to suggest, not overwhelming, but some evidence to suggest that we, in fact, can make things better as we have at different points throughout history. So also let us not fall prey to the recency bias, where the things that are happening to us now loom so large, as if this has never been experienced before. Woe is me, we're in real trouble now. This is not true. When we say India is having a moment, it's only in comparison to the trajectory of India over the past several decades, right? It is not to be saying that, oh, this is a uniquely terrible period in India's history. Unquestionably false. 
to assert that. So let's not be discouraged whenever we have a little bit of a hiccup in our human journey to think just because it's happening to us, it's the worst ever. So of course, society can be brought back together. It often takes inspired leaders who find, as the South African, uh, the late South African musician, uh, Johnny Clegg sang, who will find the word to bridge the distance between you and me. And it falls on leaders to find that language, and we will follow them, as we also tend to follow them when they divide us and make enemies uh, of neighbors. So it's a question of inspired leadership that triggers the healing of society and the, comp the capacity to find ourselves once again. So of course, India could be uh, healed because it is not mortally wounded by any means. You have surface wounds. So I encourage you to not see this as like, oh my God, this is the worst period in our history because it is not. The partition was the worst period in your modern history. Not this moment. So uh, it's not as bleak as you think, is what I'm saying. And because you are here tonight, also shows that you are a hopeful person. That you are looking for some answers. And I hope you find some of them, or the beginnings of some of those answers. Um, this is regarding your suggestion for the commons, which I think is excellent and we should all work towards it. <laughs> but I can't help feeling that in India, we have a particular cultural and religious challenge because we have been a deeply divided society on caste lines for many, many decades, in fact, centuries. Mm -hmm. So now to uh, find commons, especially in this age of social media and all the toxicity, is uh, uh, becoming more and more of a challenge. So uh, if there are any ideas on how we can approach it, because India, I think, is rather unique. Of course, we are all human beings. But we have this cultural baggage too. Yes. Um, it may be news to you, ma'am, but uh, we all carry this cultural baggage with us in every corner of the world. And it is a matter of always putting one foot in front of the other and then hoping for the best. It's sort of like my golf swing. Not to trivialize things, but when you appear on the golf course in the morning to play, you are only remembering that one last great shot you had and not the 16 bad ones or 70 bad ones. But you need to do that because you have to play again. You have to put one foot in front of the other. And despite all this cultural baggage that you talk about, I would try very hard and I would not find a single country on earth that doesn't carry its own baggage. And we just have to try to fix the problems that we have which, after all, are created by us. And we may not fix everything, but let us fix the ones that we are capable of doing. Perhaps it might inspire others to fix some of the other ones. This is a lifelong journey. You know, the, was the, in Greek mythology, the guy was pushing the rock up the hill, and it's falling back again. This appears to be our fate. But nevertheless, we do see moments of human transcendence that encourages that encourage us to, to try again and uh, make gentle uh, the life of this world. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, firstly, it was an honor to be here. Thank you so much for coming here. Uh, my question is more about uh, a divided home, uh, because I think everything starts from home. Uh, how do we deal with people scared of realizing that we're all the same and hold our identity with such insecurity? Because for any conservative um, action being told by my family or anyone. If I propose anything progressive, suddenly I'm holding the feet of the white man and I'm forgetting what being Indian means. <laughs> and for me, being Indian is completely different from what they think India is. I, I'm not expecting an answer, but I just need something. Okay. So, the, the first thing to encourage you is that we will soon die off and it will be your turn to take charge. So you can implement your ideas at that time. That's one thing. The second thing is that if you look at the arc of human progress, it's actually been extraordinary. In Nigeria, uh, before my time, they used to bury people alive with dead kings, right? They used to do human sacrifice in some parts of the country. 
There are many parts of the world where people were buried alive with kings and queens. We don't do that anymore. The Saudis still behead from time to time, but that is not common anymore. So we are making, things are not the way they always were. Let us always remind ourselves of, of that. So you now you think you are dealing with a conservative family who has not dealt with a conservative family. My mother didn't want me to marry my wife because she's from a different part of the country and she doesn't wear her hair long. We managed to overcome that, right? It happens everywhere and in every family. To me, you don't even have a problem. You have just have not found the right language with which to persuade the members of your family. So you should just try harder. Uh, you're not going to get an answer from me. <laughs> Do you think humans primarily learn from humans? And the second part would be... The, the first part I didn't hear. Do it. Do it. Do human beings primarily learn from ruins? Uh -huh. And then another question is, how and when do you think contemporary society will start to realize that we are not amongst a million species that need to share the planet symbiotic? I have no answer to your second question. <laughs> and I don't think anybody does. We just keep trying. So for example, the awareness of climate, the climate catastrophe that, contain, that confronts us, it was not this widespread 10 years or 15 years ago. But now you have children leading the battle. That is progress to me. So I can't tell you how many years, but clearly we are making progress and we should keep pushing and we might even get to the promised land. Uh, nobody actually promised us the land, but we might get there. So <laughs> your second one is, do we only learn from ruins? Yes and no. We learn from everything, including daily experiences of compassion and love and insults and bullying and everyday experiences we learn from them. But it is true that war or ruin or disaster or plagues create a certain jarring moment that helps us to develop the courage to make the change that we've always known we should make and didn't, right? So it is both yes and no. And a lot of life you will find, as you think through your own solutions for yourself, things are not binary at all. So let us even not phrase questions in that way, because it's never like that. Almost Nothing is like that. It's highly complex and it depends on the particular issue and the particular time and the particular people involved. One size does not fit all. The answer to your question is January 3rd, 2021. <laughs> and finally. <laughs> Does literature play a role? Pardon? Literature. Yes. Literature, reading, books. Do they also play a role? <coughs> to establish a just society which we were talking about. Oh, absolutely central. 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 There is no way to spark the uh, divine imagination without literature. Uh, it has to be central to our education. It has to absolutely be the core of it if we are to understand human being. It starts with that power of imagination that differentiated us from the other species. It is literature and art and music that sparks that. Science is impossible without literature and art and music. This is how we imagine a different world. Oh. Somebody sneaked in something yeah. here. Uh, in India, under present situation, do you expect the role of Mahatma Gandhi and Bhagat Singh works properly in the larger interests of the people. <laughs> this is an argument the young people have started having in South Africa. Do you think Mandela sold us out? I feel like clapping them, as the South Africans say. I said, until you have sacrificed everything for other people and not yourself, you have no right to answer that question. I mean, to ask that question until you have spent 27 years in jail and never raised your children, until your comrades have been murdered and kept in prison and chased into exile, you have no right to casually ask that question. 
So if you are not willing to sacrifice in the interest of others, you lose every right to be questioning the deals that people made to end the extraordinary catastrophe that confronted the country. So this will be my answer to this question of yours about the role of the Mahatma. They did get rid of the British, did they not? Now it seems to me lazy thinking that you think the people who dragged you across the river should have thought about all the problems you are possibly going to face in the future and they should have solved all of them in advance. This is laziness and incapacity on the part of the current generation that demands very harsh criticism from us. Because nobody solves all your problems for all time. All they did was give you a chance in conditions of human freedom to slowly solve all the challenges that are your fate in life as human beings. Thank you.